Feast TV is brought to you with support by Missouri Wines and Whole Foods Market at Town & Country and the Galleria. In this episode, we are taking you inside the culinary industry and we are spending an entire day at a culinary school near St. Louis. Then it's off to Kansas City to meet one of their up and coming chefs on the brink. Then it's off to Columbia for a culinary cocktail experience and it's back to St. Louis to meet a chef turned butcher. I'm Kat Neville and this is Feast TV. So in this episode, I am going to be making a bunch of great Tex-Mex food, which of course everybody loves. We're gonna do a red and a green salsa and also a chili quiles from Port Fonda in Kansas City, Missouri. So all of these spicy rich Tex-Mex dishes are going to be paired with a sparkling wine from Les Bourgeois, which is right in the middle of the state of Missouri near Columbia. So before I get started on Port Fonda's recipe, let's head over to Kansas City and meet them now. What is valuable to you about your relationship with Patrick? Well, Patrick is, he's very well known in Kansas City. Uh, this place is very well known. Patrick is, he's very positive. He has, a, he has a very almost infectious love of Kansas City. Everything is going forward. And Patrick is one of the most sort of, I, not if he's, I don't know if he's leading that charge, but he's one of the, the faces and voices of this really cool scene that's happening here. The experience here at Port Fonda is, um, I like to tell people that it's a Midwestern Mexican restaurant. Um, we serve you know, Midwestern Mexican food and we specialize in Mexican drinks. Um, a lot of focus on tequila and mezcal. I think we have the best selection here in Kansas City for sure. So I met David Ford where he kind of reached out to me. He told me that him and his now soon-to-be wife were moving back to Kansas City. They were thinking about opening up their own restaurant and wanted a place to kind of be at while they were planning that. I like to use familiar flavors in sort of a fun new way. Uh, take an ingredient that you would expect. I mean, you already know what a cauliflower tastes like, but there's a lot of cool ways to make cauliflower. I'm gonna roast it in our wood oven right back here. Make a pepita salsa to go on top. Some places deal with the sous chef situation a lot differently. Some people want to cultivate that relationship and want it to grow and they want them to you know, eventually leave and open up their own place because it's a great reflection on your business and you as a chef or as an owner. And I think um, that's how I like, I want to deal with it as a training ground and a, a learning you know, opportunity for, for him. So he's best equipped to open up his own place with all the tools that he needs. So there really is a lot of value to having a connected food community yes. because it allows you to come in and not only learn culinary technique or new right. ingredients, but also become a deeper part of the community. So when you do go out on your own, right. you kind of have that leg And it's up. here. Everybody is so supportive. So why do you want to own your own restaurant? Well, I think that, I mean, it's kind of everyone's dream to work for themselves, you know? So I think, plus I think that I could offer something that isn't here right now, so I think that's, you know, there would be a good market for that. With David here, it's a lot more of an organic and a real relationship that like I can't wait to see him succeed and I can't wait to like see what he does because it's real and it's authentic. You know, it's not like he doesn't owe me anything, you know, it's just a, it's a part of, you know, he's helping me out a ton and he makes my life a lot better and I, I can't wait to do the same for him. So one of my favorite things about 
Tex-Mex, Mexican food, is all the different salsas that you get. Both of the salsas that we're making are cooked. And these recipes were developed by a woman named Carrie Houck, who takes folks down to Mexico on wonderful culinary adventures. So this first one will be the red salsa, and we're going to be roasting the veggies. So I am just slicing up eight Roma tomatoes. And now we have some dried peppers. You can use whatever dried peppers you really like depending on the heat level that you're going for. Next, we're just going to add a couple of garlic cloves and we're just going to do a half of an onion and these are white onions, which are what you see typically used in Mexican cooking. This is gonna go into a relatively hot oven, 475, and when it's blistered and soft, I'm gonna pull it out. While my veggies are roasting away in the oven, this is one of the ingredients that makes the salsa so unique. It is sesame seeds. It's really starting to toast up. It smells lovely. Now this can go from toasted to burn very, very quickly. And when it smells done, it is. So I'm gonna turn this off and then I'm just gonna put this into the food processor with a little bit of chicken stock. I adore really spicy, really rich salsas, and this would be one of them. These smell so good, and you know how when you just cook a plain, just tomato, all that, all the sugar just kind of caramelizes? That's what it, it smells like in here, it's lovely. So I am just going to drop all the veggies into the food processor and give them a whir. Oh, it smells amazing. So before I add all that wonderful tomato mixture, I'm gonna be sauteing our sesame seed puree in just a little bit of olive oil, about a quarter cup or so. Now, add in all that gorgeous tomato and onion. While the red salsa is simmering away on the stove, I am just chopping up about a cup's worth of fresh cilantro that we're going to incorporate at the very, very end. All right, I'm gonna go check on that salsa and see how it's doing. Oh yeah, it's starting to thicken up. This is gorgeous. Needs a little bit of salt. Look at this, this is beautiful. Oh, and now I'm just stirring in that cup of fresh cilantro that I chopped up. So this is almost finished and I'm gonna go ahead and get started on the salsa verde. And while I do, let's head to Ladue, Missouri to meet one of the new school butchers. I kind of just fell into butchery actually. Uh, as far as learning butchery, I'd never done much of it other than breaking down pigs in restaurants I've worked at in the past. Uh, so it's kind of like a lot of teaching myself as I went, um, repetition and practice, uh, reading all of the resources. Somebody says, I really like the pork chops. And I'll say, why don't we try a pork porterhouse? It's an interesting cut. There's not a lot of shops that carry it. You know, I'll just try to push them in a direction to experience something new. The reason why we line the dryage room with pink Himalayan salt. First of all, it looks beautiful. Second of all, it helps draw a lot of moisture out of the dryage product. And also, after a certain amount of time, uh, the room will actually begin to develop its own flavor. Uh, let's head back and I'll show you the salt room. Okay. This is incredible. So, how many pounds of meat are here right now? Uh, probably right around five, six, maybe seven hundred pounds. Incredible. Hanging, uh, plus more on the shelves. And this design, did you guys design this custom to fit the room, or is this kind of a standard thing? I've never seen this before. Uh, you know, I think the track is, a lot, is pretty standard for like meat processing plants and other butcher shops. Uh, I know we had an architect involved. Um, and we had a construction company come and fit it all out for us. 
And it, you know, it's interesting. I mean, it's cold in here. Sure. And, um, and what is the humidity? You said the, the humidity was really important. Sure, yeah. So we try to keep it around 68. Um, basically, you always want to make sure that when you touch the walls, you're not feeling any moisture. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of the good guideline. And we also have, uh, you know, it's all controlled. We're gonna, you're actually gonna show me how to break down one of these half pigs, sure. correct? Sure, yeah, let's do it. Do you want to just, should we pick one from here or is one already waiting for us? Yeah, we'll take one of these down. All right, perfect. So this is a, a Berkshire hog from uh, Black Springs Farm, uh, from Larry Black. Uh, this particular half is just a little over 100 pounds, just about. Just a kind of brief overview of the parts. You know, we have the trotters or the feet, the hocks right above that, uh, the Boston butt, the shoulder, rib section, the belly, the skirt stakes that's right inside there, uh, the leaf lard that is basically the kidney fat, uh, and then we have the loin um, just, just above the vertebrae, uh, tenderloin, and the ham. And we'll get right to it. The first step that's uh, you know breaking the pieces apart, uh, I always go between the second and third rib and then we uh, pull the shoulder and the butt up to that. One of the things that we like to sell out of the shop here is a bone and belly chop. So we'll leave these little ribs on here. You know, they end about here. I've never heard of a bone and belly chop before. I have to try one. I know, that sounds really fun. So I'll reserve this. And we have another belly section. And you can see that it even looks like bacon here. So here we have the loin, and this is the tenderloin right here. So we'll trim off some of that fat. And there is a difference between the loin and the tenderloin. You know the loin is what you're going to get your standard pork chops out of, and when you go to the store and get the pork tenderloin, it's a lot smaller, um, there's less fat. Um, personally for me, it has less flavor too, I'm not a big fan. Kind of like the filet mignon on Exactly. Our, yeah. You know, I always try to push people away from the tenderloin and try something with a little more love. So this is the short loin, mm -hmm. uh, which is where the porterhouses come from, or T-bones. As you can see at this end, we call it, I call it the blade steak. That meat is beautiful. Here's a good portion of a uh, porterhouse right there. Yeah, that's beautiful. And then here you have your uh, bone and pork chop. One of the cool cuts that is good for charcuterie, the copa, which is a familiar title for a lot of people. So I'll just come up here and go under these bones. So the copa is the same as what you might know as a beef delmonica. When you cut it in the chops, you just get these beautiful, marbled, fat-filled, flavorful pork chops. If you're not using local farms and you're not trying to process your own meat, um, you're almost like not doing your job to the fullest capability, you know? Thank you. I yeah, really no appreciate problem. you taking the time to do this. It's eye-opening, and I know that people are going to enjoy watching the process. Absolutely. It's been a lot of fun. Good. So we're on to the salsa verde, which of course means green salsa, and tomatillos are going to be the base for this. And when you buy tomatillos in the store, they have this papery husk around them and all you have to do is just peel that off, give them a good rinse, and then you can chop them. This is another roasted salsa. And again, the reason why we're doing that is just to heighten the flavors and caramelize the sugars and everything. Now, just another half of this onion, and then the jalapenos. You can do between four and six. You could use serrano peppers if you want. It all depends on the level of heat that you're looking for. Oh, and you can, you can smell the heat of these jalapenos just cutting into them. And then just a couple of cloves of garlic. I'm gonna put this in an extremely hot oven for just a little bit until it blisters up. Ha ha, ha. It has emerged from the oven and it is screaming hot because I've had it under the broiler and everything is blistered and a little bit charred, which is exactly what you're looking for. So I'm gonna let it cool off for just a second and then I'm gonna pop it into the food processor. And remember, you want it to be coarse. 
so I am just pulsing it. All right, I'm just gonna take this over to the stove with my spoon. A little bit of either olive oil or vegetable oil, whatever you have on hand. Okay. Ooh, haha. <laughs> So the idea is absolutely to fry this salsa and to caramelize it even further and add that extra layer of flavor. I'm also going to toss in some salt at this point. Gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. So the majority of the moisture has already kind of cooked out and been evaporated. So what I'm going to do is add in about a cup of chicken stock and allow this to continue simmering. And while I do that, let's head to Sycamore in Columbia, Missouri to meet one of our area's bartenders who is pairing his cocktails with the restaurant's food. We are at Sycamore in Columbia, Missouri, where I tend bar at one of the best farm to table restaurants in the area. So in all the same ways that wine or a beer can potentially pair with food, cocktails are the same way. So when I build a cocktail, I'm thinking, does it need more acid to pair with a certain sort of dish? Does the acid need to be brought down a little? Does it need to be additional sweetness? We were mentioning about pairing, and with the salad here, the dominant flavor in the salad is going to be the blue cheese. We are going to make the Venetian. It's a very light and airy cocktail. Put a little ice in the wine glass, and take the Aperol, take an ounce of that. Seems like this would also be really great just in the summer. Yes. Just a refreshing Absolutely. kind of sipper. Yes. But to give us some of that bubbliness, we're going to use about an ounce of the soda water, maybe just a dash more. And then it's just a, a white wine on top of that. Is this a crisp white wine? Is it more like... It's going to be a little bit fruit forward, but kind of a tart finish. Very cool. Can I taste it? Absolutely, babe. Be my guest. Mmm. Oh, I love that. It's something that's perfect for starting a meal because it's gonna lead into kind of heavier flavors exactly. down the road. All right, so what we're gonna do now is we've kind of tasted this a little bit. We're gonna move on to a main course. So let's just move some of this out of the way here. This is cobia, which is a saltwater fish. We have pisco, which is an unaged South American brand. We're actually gonna use some house-made sour mix with the pisco and the algarro bean. Oh, fun. So we're gonna take about an ounce and a half of the pisco. We're gonna use a nice, generous ounce of the black carob syrup. Okay. And then our nice house-made sour mix. And we have this pisco sweet and sour, basically, which we're calling the algarro bean. You have featured this black carob syrup because it's a Mediterranean sugar alternative sweetener that's gonna go with, with this Mediterranean preparation of the cobia. All right, I have to try it. It's got a lovely, fresh flavor to it. All right, so we've tasted this algarro bina with, with the cobia, and we're gonna move on and have a little dessert. So this is a flourless chocolate cake the fruit compote, the raspberry. It's gorgeous. I could overload you with chocolate, or I can bring in some of those, like I said, contrast some of those other flavor notes. So what we're gonna do is go a little ice, a little frozen blueberry. We're gonna take this berry-infused vodka. We're gonna give it about two ounces. I love the color. Nice light pink. It's yeah. not like aggressively pink. It's yeah. just kind of... It's not too girly. Right. And then we're just going to give it a little soda water, which is going to even bring that color down some. So the thing about these particular berries is they're not like really sugar heavy. They're, you know, berries can be sweet, but with some of that tartness still. That's so fresh. And again, like you're saying, it's not sweet. If you notice the kind of progression of the three drinks we've gone through, the key we, we keep saying is that it's bright, it's fresh, it's airy, it's light. I have had a wonderful experience just seeing the way that you create these food-friendly cocktails, so thank you. Thank you. What I like going towards now is 
breaking it down into simpler parts. We've had really elaborate cocktails. I really, I really want to feature the spirit and really bring its natural flavors out. I want to feature that the distiller made it to have that flavor profile. And if I'm going to build a cocktail around it, I want it to simply uh, accentuate that flavor. Now we're going to make the Port Fonda Chilequiles, and this is extremely easy. Just in this pan, I'm going to take roughly eight ounces of the salsa that I made, and if you don't feel like making your own salsa, it's okay. You can just use something out of a jar. I'm also going to be stirring in four ounces of cooked chorizo, which is a spicy, Mexican uh, sausage. So if you want a really authentic flavor, definitely seek out the chorizo. And now I'm gonna add in my beer. And you wanna do a beer that is relatively light in flavor. Don't pick one that has a lot of hops or anything like that because as you cook it, it's just going to intensify and you don't want any bitterness or anything like that to overwhelm all your other flavors. This is simmered for just a little bit and now just adding in a couple of handfuls of tortillas. And the idea is to cook these tortillas so that they kind of absorb the liquid that is in the pan, but you don't want them to turn to mush. So keep an eye on it and just cook them until they have just a nice kind of bite to them essentially. This is the exact kind of thing when you've been out late on a Saturday night that you want to have on a Sunday morning, preferably with a margarita. Here's the base of the dish. And I'm just gonna fry up two eggs, sunny side, and put those on top of our tortillas. <laughs> okay, these sunny side up eggs are perfect. I like them to have a little bit of a crispy edge to them. And uh, you know where they learn to fry perfect eggs? That would be at culinary school. And so let's head next to Hickey College near St. Louis and find out how it's done. Culinary field is something that I always wanted to do and I've always had a huge passion for, especially with baking. And about four years after high school, after going to various colleges, I realized I'm finally gonna do what I always wanted to do. And I'm doing it and it's the best thing I've ever done. I love it, every second of it. I think the importance of uh, culinary school and what you take away is just being well-rounded and having the tools necessary to be successful and to you know, be a good employee and, and then build from there and be willing to work hard and have fun and enjoy the, the, the career you've chosen. Um, it's unlimited. It, it's not just a, a single uh, opportunity to become a chef, but there's so many opportunities, so many doors they'll open. The students can take their diplomas and their associates and, and go any which direction. There's so many places in the industry they can end up. Front of the house, management, healthcare, you know, hotels, again, chef, restaurant, kitchens, uh, food writing, there's so many things you can do. So today, I got to school about an hour and a half early, and then around about 8.30 is when we went to our beverage class and this week this week and last week we've been going over wines and today we went ahead and looked at wine labels and from those we then figured out the vintage what kind of wine it is what the body is and just the basic things what you can get out of a wine just from looking at the bottle hey, well, I'm so confused. Right. I'm confused. Where did you see because you said it was a north all right and once we cross the double doors mm -hmm. the students are expected to be in full uniform hats, neckerchief, apron. And, and why is that? It's a mise en place, mental and physical mise en place. So they're prepared for what's in store. If they're ready now, they'll have a good day in the kitchen. Okay. Today they're working on practicals and knife cuts. So we'll see four different, or different students at the stoves working on a practical exam. They, they make a classical soup and a classical dish from start to finish. So then after our second class is then um, classical cuisine and this week is actually practicals week and each day we're doing a different dish today was our tornadoes bernie which is a beef dish and so when you say classic you're talking about european it's approach. a scoffier yep it's very very classical techniques 
uh, the flavors building from the beginning. Foundation. The foundation. Mm -hmm. Then they go from this phase to Garmage Charcuterie. Okay. Chef John teaches that also. And then they finish international cuisine. That's, that's huge. Before the, it's, it's, they go in 40 days, they'll travel to 22 different countries. Wow. And they cook a lot of different foods, but they can do that because they've done these. Where I worked in the food industry since I was about 16, 15 or 16, and worked there for about six and a half, almost seven years. And with school, I just started getting drained out with the same book work, and there just was no passion, no fire behind what I was doing. And finally, I was like, I can't keep going on without that passion there. The tools necessary really are built on the hard skills, obviously knife skills, being able to do the techniques required in, in a professional kitchen, but we also focus equally on the soft skills. Being a professional, very, very important to us. It's definitely surprising when they see that it's not just food, not just cooking, but it's the full package, and we really focus on all of that for our students. It's really inspiring to see how much can be created from like a basic mirepoix and incorporate that into sauces, soups, and you can take those soups and turn it into other kinds of soups. It's just a whole world of things to be created and to be eaten. <laughs> Samosas, it looks like, right? Right. Looks good. And after kitchen class, we have professional development with Chef Christine. Today, we were going over our resumes and discussing what to expect during interviews and the interview process. In addition to your maturity physically, how you handle yourself in the situation, do you have appropriate answers prepared? I love being involved with the people that are around me. I love helping people. If you can bring a smile to their face, I'm totally all right with that. And that's what I want to do, because that's you're serving people. At the end of the day, you're serving people. Uh, I think a lot of it started from uh, Food TV Network and, and what the expectations of I want to be a chef means. But there's, it's so much bigger in, in many ways. And that's the, the, the great thing about culinary school, is you can take that and build from it for the rest of your career. So here we have our Mexican brunch fiesta spread, and I'm just kind of finishing up the garnishes. So I am just gonna julienne this onion, and the trick to this is coming in at an angle on a really, really thin cut. This is how you end up with these nice slices that you can kind of tuck around all your dishes. So here are our garnishes, and I am pairing our Mexican feast with sparkling wine from Le Bourgeois, which is right in the middle of Missouri. All right. It's always good to have a glass of bubbles at brunch, and a sparkling wine is gonna cut through the spice and the richness. It's gonna be a great pair. So thank you for joining me, and I'll see you next time. Mm. Mm, that's good. <laughs>